Steve Nash is one of the cleverest point guards and sharpest shooters ever to walk the earth. The Canadian converted soccer player dribbled in loops and zigzags, manipulating traffic until he found space to deliver a perfect pass to a roller or an open shooter only he saw. Nash had an impeccable shooting motion, a form so rehearsed, so sturdily built, that it served not just open shots, but one-legged runners and floaters off a spin. And he was remarkably durable in his prime, despite a congenital spine disorder that required so much time spent reclining on the floor. All these attributes made Nash a statistical marvel, near perfect from the free throw line, among the most accurate three-point shooters ever and just as deft inside the arc. Nash regularly led the league in passing, racking up more career assists than almost anyone ever. And with the production came acclaim, all-star, all NBA first team, consecutive MVP trophies, a spot in the Hall of Fame. Steve Nash was brilliant, renowned, iconic, but never a champion. Why? Why did his teams, some of them great and even revolutionary, never win at all? How exactly did Steve Nash, of all people, retire without a title? Even Nash's first short-haired stint with the Suns had some unfulfilled promise. After graduating from Santa Clara, Nash went to Phoenix with the 15th pick in the legendary 1996 NBA draft. This was a revolving door era of Suns basketball. The roster and coaching staff turned over quite a bit in just two years, and always in a way that put at least one point guard ahead of Nash in the depth chart. Nash rode the bench for a team that certainly wasn't a contender, but nearly made some noise in the 97 playoffs. The seven-seeded Suns actually took a 2-1 series lead against the defending Western Conference champion Seattle Supersonics. And this preposterous, one-footed Rex Chapman heave sent the potential clincher game four to overtime. But Phoenix faltered in OT, then watched their Cinderella dreams fade in a blowout game five loss in Seattle. The 97-98 Suns were something else entirely. For a moment, the revolving door spat out a very good, very fun team. Danny Ainge was head coach, Jason Kidd was the young star point guard, and Antonio McDice the newly acquired young rim smasher. They shared the scoring with a strong supporting cast that also played tough defense. Phoenix rode a late season hot streak to 56 wins. While veteran Kevin Johnson's health faltered, Nash got real minutes, both as Kidd's backup and alongside him. But in the playoffs, Avery Johnson outplayed both those guys, and rookie Tim Duncan led the way in San Antonio's first round upset of the Suns. It's fascinating to imagine an alternate universe in which those Suns kept at it. What if two of the best point guards ever remained teammates through their primes? What if McDice stuck around, stayed healthy, and fulfilled his superstar potential? Alas, in our universe, the Suns wouldn't commit to two up-and-coming point guards. So they capitalized on the buzz around Nash and sent him to the Dallas Mavericks in a trade that brought back some picks. That will become relevant later on, but first we gotta talk about what happened to Dallas. Draft Night 98 was an era-defining date in Mavericks history. They got Nash, and they acquired this tremendous German boy named Dirk Nowitzki. After a couple seasons losing and growing up, the Mavs entered the 21st century with a new owner, an innovative coach, and a big three equipped to run and gun. Nash distributed the basketballs, Nowitzki flummoxed opposing big men with his range, Michael Finley slashed and created for himself. All could shoot, all were encouraged to do so. Dallas improved a bit each year of the new millennium and made four postseasons with Nash. In 2001, they recorded 53 wins and came back to upset Karl Malone and the Jazz in the first round of the playoffs, but got rocked by Duncan and the Spurs in the next round. These two seasons ended thanks in large part to Mike Bibby. In 02, Nash and Nowitzki debuted as all-star teammates. Dallas bumped up to 57 wins, swept Kevin Garnett and the Wolves out of the first round, then faced the Sacramento Kings in a 2002 Western Conference semifinal. Nash's best performance of that series helped Dallas snatch Game 2 in Sacramento and thus home court advantage. But in Game 3, Nash went ice cold, Dirk struggled against smaller Kings defenders, 
and Finley's 37 points weren't enough. Dallas had a chance to keep things even. Sacramento's Peja Stojakovic had been hurt in Game 3, and Chris Webber fouled out midway through the fourth quarter of a close Game 4. Chris Webber is fouled out of the game! But Bibby, who killed Dallas all series, shook Dirk on a switch to tie the game in regulation, and Dallas totally mishandled their winning opportunity. Then Bibby danced himself free again to take a late lead in overtime, and Dirk's last second lefty floater rimmed out. The Kings went up three games to one, then wrapped the series in five. And to skip ahead a bit, Bibby was awesome again in a first round victory over the Mavs in 2004. That was another five gamer, but it was closer than that. In game two, Nash missed a big late shot, then Peja Stojakovic stripped Finley on a crucial last second possession. Nash missed a buzzer beater that would have sent game four to overtime. Nowitzki missed one that would have won game five. The Kings advanced. So that's these three seasons, but we've saved the best for last. The 0-2-0-3 Mavericks ran, shot, and limited turnovers to lead the NBA in offensive efficiency by a wide margin. And they defended pretty well too. The Mavs won their first 14 straight games and ended with 60 victories overall. They got dangerously close to blowing a 3-0 series lead in the first round of the 2003 playoffs, but Dirk's amazing fourth quarter in Game 7 kept the Portland Trailblazers from making history. In the next round, Dallas got the victory they needed over the Kings. Veteran sixth man Nick Van Exel had a couple otherworldly scoring performances for the Mavs. Dirk was amazing in Game 7, and just as crucially, Weber suffered a devastating knee injury early in the series. That derailed his and Sacramento's title hopes, although they would get that revenge over the Mavs in 04. Anyway, every NBA champion needs some fortunate breaks to get there. The Weber injury helped the 03 Mavs reach the Western Conference Finals, the farthest the franchise had advanced since the 80s. There they met another familiar foe, the Spurs, who in typical fashion were transitioning between eras seamlessly. This was the last season for David Robinson, the first season for a future big three of Duncan, Tony Parker, and Manu Ginobili, and oh, also San Antonio won 60 games of their own. The Spurs were ridiculous, and they had just confirmed as much by becoming the first opponent in four years to eliminate Shaq and Kobe from the playoffs. And yet, the Mavs showed up in San Antonio and immediately proved they belonged. Their own big three combined for 86 points in game one of the Western Conference Finals. Nash outplayed the young Parker, Finley roasted Steven Jackson to take a lead in the closing seconds, and Dirk sunk a couple clutch free throws to help secure victory. That meant even after the Spurs commanded game two, the series scooted over to Dallas with the Mavs in control. But that first home game of the series was a disaster. Parker wrecked Nash head to head. Van Exel led Dallas to a first half lead, but they squandered the whole thing and then some in the second half. And at the tail end of a deflating home loss, Nowitzki collided with Ginobili, spraining his left knee badly enough that, try as he might, Dirk couldn't play the next few games. Duncan and friends won the first Dirkless game to go up 3-1, but on the brink of elimination, the Mavs made a huge fourth quarter comeback and stole game five in San Antonio. Back in Dallas, the Mavs really looked like they'd pushed the series to seven. Parker could barely compete because of a stomach virus, and two of Don Nelson's late series additions to the starting lineup, Van Exel and Walt Williams, stepped up their scoring to pick up a lagging Nash and Finley. The Mavs led by double digits in the fourth quarter, swarming Duncan every time he touched the ball. But Spurs coach Greg Popovich found another way to attack and swiftly sucked the life out of Dallas. First, Jackson narrowed the gap with ballsy back-to-back -back threes, then he passed the sticks to Steve Kerr, the little-used 37-year-old who had already announced his intention to end his illustrious career after the season. Kerr went off, leading a 23-0 fourth quarter run with three three-pointers in two minutes. This man has been killing it. Kerr again! Steve Kerr with another three! The Mavs didn't score at all for eight minutes. They had nine fourth quarter points. So game six had once looked like a sure win that would force a decisive seventh game, possibly extending the series long enough for a Dirk return. Instead, the blowout inverted, and the best Mavs season of this era crashed in front of their home fans. 
The in-state rival went on to win Robinson one more ring before fully shifting into a new era that would hurt Nash even more. But yeah, those are the four Stephen Dirk playoff runs. The most promising one yielded to injury and a brutal collapse. In the final one, Nash and Nowitzki once again weren't good enough or clutch enough to beat the Kings at full strength. And after that early exit in 2004, Mavs owner Mark Cuban lowballed the 30-year-old Nash in free agency, opting to build around Nowitzki. Cuban has since described letting Nash walk as one of his greatest regrets, and splitting this tandem would still haunt Dallas if Dirk hadn't led the Mavs to a title with some old Nash friends in 2011. In any event, Nash wanted what he was worth in the summer of 04 and accepted a big new contract with his old team in Phoenix. But this wasn't his old team. This was something new, something that would raise his excellence to a whole new level, something that would revolutionize NBA basketball, something that, in spite of it all, would fall short of a championship. Nash was the crown jewel in a rapid rebuild that began the prior season. The Suns already had Sean Marion, the unconventional star acquired with the Dallas draft pick they got by trading Nash back in 98. They had Amari Stoudemire, the young Thunderbolt who'd struck enough rims to win Rookie of the Year in 03 and was eager to rebound from an injury-shortened sophomore season. They had Mike D'Antoni, an Italian legend still relatively obscure in his home country who'd recently been promoted to become an NBA head coach for just the second time. And once Phoenix dumped the contracts of Stefan Marbury and Penny Hardaway on the Knicks, they had room to sign Nash. While other important people came and went over the next few seasons, these four men formed the nucleus of a groundbreaking attack known as seven seconds or less. That was how fast D'Antoni wanted his small, offense-oriented lineups to race up the floor and shoot. And that was how fast Phoenix joined contention for the NBA championship, remaining a favorite for most of the rest of the decade. They just never won it. Some weird, shitty thing always intervened. First, it was a broken face. For a trailblazing team, the 0405 Suns were remarkably simple, a perfect harmony of style and personnel. Stoudemire could score anything inside. GM Brian Colangelo stocked the rotation with players who could score from outside. D'Antoni made that rotation sing. Off a make or a miss, Nash would sprint up the floor hunting a quick bucket. Cover that, and he'd hit Amari galloping to the rim. Cover that, and he'd find an open shooter. Try to cover all of the above, and Nash would gladly apply the dagger himself. In the event of a breakdown, both Marion and rising youngster Joe Johnson provided some creative scoring on top of their shooting prowess. Those two were also best equipped to guard opposing stars on a team that didn't defend very well overall. But maybe you didn't need to defend when you ran the fastest pace in the NBA and shot the most threes at the highest accuracy for the league's best offense. Colangelo won Executive of the Year, D'Antoni won Coach of the Year, and the Suns won 62 games, the NBA's best record just a year after winning 29. And their engine, the piece that made it all possible, won MVP, a remarkable achievement for a former mid-major kid. The offensive machine opened the postseason by sweeping Pow, J. Will, and the Grizzlies. Nash put up unbelievable scoring numbers in the next round against his old friends. When the Mavs overcame Nash's career-high 48 points to win Game 4 and tie the series, Nash followed with a 34-point triple-double in a Game 5 victory. Then he stuck a huge three to send Game 6 to overtime, rebounded his pal Dirk's last-second OT miss, and sunk free throws that helped ice the whole thing. Eliminating his old friend set Nash up to rematch an old foe. The Suns met San Antonio in the 2005 Western Conference Finals, but not all the Suns, not right away. Joe Johnson had never missed a game for Phoenix until this moment in Game 2 against the Mavs when a Jerry Stackhouse foul fractured a bone in his left eye socket. A quick turnaround between series meant that Johnson didn't recover from surgery in time for Games 1 and 2 against the Spurs. The league's best offense had to protect home court against the league's best defense without one of its top scorers, and it didn't go so hot. In game one, Nash kept up the scoring, Stoudemire was unbelievable, and veteran Jim Jackson stepped up in Johnson's place. But Marion struggled, and the big, deliberate Spurs threw Phoenix off their game. 
D'Antoni capitulated somewhat style-wise, playing more orthodox lineups with a true center, Steven Hunter, alongside Stoudemire. Tony Parker led a typically excellent outing from San Antonio's big three, and Brent Barry's hot shooting helped San Antonio pull away in the fourth. Game two was more of the same. Robert Ori and Ginobili missed some big free throws to give Phoenix a chance at overtime, but Nash bricked his prayer to beat the buzzer. Even Johnson's return for game three didn't help. Phoenix fell way behind and ended up losing in five on their home floor. It's official, the San Antonio Spurs are going back to the NBA Finals. The Spurs took the opportunity to remind their victim that defense, not offense, wins championships. And they did. Joe Johnson still believes Phoenix would have beat the Spurs and beat the Pistons in the finals had he been healthy for the start of the round. But he and that version of the Suns didn't run it back. Johnson wanted the salary and status of a star and the Suns obliged by trading him to Atlanta. Stoudemire missed basically the whole following season and postseason recovering from surgery on his knee cartilage. And his backup, Kurt Thomas, suffered a significant injury in February. So Phoenix's 06 title hopes looked busted, but they stayed good by getting weirder. D'Antoni leaned on two-way newcomer Raja Bell, the Brazilian blur Leandro Barbosa, a couple new guys happy to just spot up outside, and the one player they got in the Johnson trade, Boris Diaw, an overstuffed French guard who D'Antoni decided to use as an undersized center because f it. This team was awesome. And despite the spare parts, the Suns' reliable engine made it all work, efficiently enough to win the team 54 games and himself another MVP. The 2006 playoffs were a slog. Phoenix had to claw back from a first round deficit against Kobe Bryant's Lakers. Tim Thomas forced game six to overtime with a last second three-pointer, and the Suns rode the momentum from that win to a game seven blowout. Elton Brand and the Clippers pushed Phoenix to the limit again in the next round, but the Suns took that Game 7 in another blowout, setting up a second straight Western Conference Final, this time against the Mavericks. The depleted Suns just didn't have the juice for that one. When role players overperformed, Phoenix won. Diaw dropped an astounding 34 points, including the decisive bucket to steal Game 1 on the road, and Barbosa spearheaded a Game 4 victory. But in between, Tim Thomas's hot shooting in Game 2 cooled at the wrong time. He missed a couple late threes that could have improbably stacked the odds in the Suns' favor. So the series returned to Dallas tied at 2, and the Suns couldn't hang in Game 5. Raja Bell was dragging a sore calf, Nash went ice cold from the field, and Dirk played one of the best games of his life, pouring in a 50-point performance at which his old friend and opponent could only marvel. In Game 6, the Suns took a big lead but ran out of steam late. A shorthanded, overachieving squad got eliminated at home in front of a deeply appreciative crowd who knew full well the man in the suit was the key to preventing this fate next season. And indeed, the Suns didn't lose the conference finals in 07. They didn't make it that far. The 2007 Suns were a happy blend of the star-studded 05 team and the scrappy 06 team. The big names returned healthy and excellent, and guys like Bell, Diaw, and new sixth man of the year Barbosa retained important roles. This team blazed through the regular season, handled the Lakers in the first round of the playoffs, and got some help from afar. The Mavericks had the league's best record by a long shot, and Dirk prevented his buddy from winning a third straight MVP. But in the first round of the playoffs, Dallas suffered a humiliating, historic upset against the Golden State Warriors a team coached by Don Nelson and bearing some resemblance to the small, three happy Suns. With the Mavs toppled, a second round matchup between the two seed Suns and three seed Spurs felt like a de facto conference final, if not an outright championship given the weakness of the Eastern Conference. It got off to a rough start for Phoenix. Duncan outplayed Stoudemire in game one, old friend Michael Finley stepped up for San Antonio, and Nash's battle with Parker got complicated when their faces smashed together late in the fourth quarter of a close game. While the Sun staff tried in vain to patch Nash's oozing schnoz, the star had to sit most of the final minute. This thing just, it won't stop bleeding. So desperate to get back in the game. He watched helplessly while Barbosa bricked a shot for the lead, then Stoudemire blew a chance to keep it a one possession game in the final seconds. Band-Aid Nash helped lead Phoenix to a blowout Game 2 victory, 
but San Antonio won a rough Game 3 at home. Game 4 would be pivotal. Phoenix played perhaps their best basketball of the round to come back from 11 down in the fourth quarter and win the thing, tying the series at 2-all and restoring home court advantage. But that's not why it was pivotal. It was pivotal because this Robert Ory intentional foul in the final seconds looked particularly intentional to the Suns. After he hip-checked Nash into the scores table, a scuffle ensued and in the chaos, Stoudemire and Diaw broke a league rule by leaving the sideline. They each got a one-game suspension while Ori got two. The Suns rightfully made a huge stink about strict application of a kinda bullshit rule, but couldn't change the fact that they'd have to play a huge, tie-breaking Game 5 far more depleted than the team that started the fracas. Nonetheless, the Suns came out hungry in front of a wrathful home crowd. Nash didn't shoot well, but he helped Marion to a strong outing while Kurt Thomas issued a gritty performance in Stoudemire's stead. This one was a defensive struggle, and a famously defenseless team with basically no bench almost won it. Manu Ginobili compared Phoenix's play to hurt animals, but his own fourth quarter excellence undid a Suns lead. Bruce Bowen, a target of fan ridicule for his dirty play earlier in the series, buried a dagger from the corner to put the Spurs ahead three in the final minute, and Duncan capped a great game by deterring Nash's last attempt to tie it. The Suns got back to full staff for Game 6 in San Antonio, and Amari played brilliantly in his return. But the whole Big 3 showed up for the Spurs. They took a big lead into the fourth that a Nash-led rally couldn't overcome. Nash couldn't hide his bitterness at how the series unfolded, and while giving the Spurs credit, wondered aloud how things might have gone without those suspensions. A series this important didn't deserve this big of a mess, and it doesn't make anyone feel any better that disgraced NBA ref Tim Donaghy officiated the feisty Game 3. It's always hard to determine how much weight to put into this stuff, but Donaghy later wrote the series was badly officiated, and even claimed that ref supervisor Tommy Nunez held some sort of grudge against Suns owner Robert Sarver. I don't know, but that Suns team might have won Game 1 if Nash's nose didn't fall off, might have won the series without questionable suspensions, and would then have been favored to cruise to the 07 title just like the Spurs did. Of all the what-ifs in Nash's career, that has to be the greatest. The next season, Steve Kerr took over as GM and traded Suns lifer Marion for 35-year-old Shaq at the deadline. The Suns remained good in a crowded West, but they faced the Spurs once again in the playoffs and squandered their best chance to spark an upset when Finley's three-pointer sent Game 1 in San Antonio to overtime, Duncan of all people hit a three to send it to double OT, and Ginobili won it in the final seconds. D'Antoni did what he could to weaponize his new center, but Popovich just about neutralized the big Shaktis with an aggressive hack-a-shack approach. Hack-a-shack-tus? Hack-tus-a-shack-tus? Anyway, the Spurs bounced the Suns in five, and soon thereafter, D'Antoni left town for a job with the Knicks. His replacement, Terry Porter, got fired in the middle of the 08-09 season as a scary Stoudemire eye injury and a downish year for Nash kept the Suns out of the playoffs. This sensational tandem was nearing its end, but they snuck in one more legitimate title run before falling apart. The 09-10 Suns played new coach Alvin Gentry's mildly reformed version of D'Antoni Ball, and they made it work. Steve and Amari got back to their best and healthiest production, veteran Jason Richardson and mega-veteran Grant Hill played crucial supporting roles, and the rest of the rotation was a mix of shooting and youthing. Phoenix shot extremely well from outside and kept it up in the playoffs. They beat LaMarcus Aldridge and the Blazers in six, then finally slayed their demons with a sweep, a sweep of the Spurs in the second round. After their brief and shallow two-year valley, the Suns were back in the 2010 Western Conference Finals where they'd face a new version of an old foe. The restocked, reinvigorated, defending champion LA Lakers. In the first four games, both teams held serve with comfortable home wins to bring the series back to LA tied 2 all. And the Suns put the pressure on in the critical game five. They trailed by as many as 18 points in the second half, but Nash narrowed the gap in the fourth with bucket after bucket after bucket after bucket. Nash again in the face of Gasol. Late in the fourth, he rebounded his own miss, then the Suns retrieved another carom, 
Then Jason Richardson banked in the game-tying shot with just three seconds left. Finally, Phoenix had gotten a break, and they defended Kobe's final attempt perfectly to send the game to overtime. Oh, no. The man now known as Meta World Peace just overpowered Richardson to put back a buzzer-beating game winner. Yet another cruel finish wasted yet another inspired comeback. The Suns looked drained back at home in Game 6. They once again dug a big hole, and Kobe made absolutely sure they wouldn't climb out this time. That was it. Amari followed Dan Tony to New York in the 2010 offseason, and the Suns commenced a lengthy playoff drought. Nash's Suns were incredible, among the most stylistically pure, winningest squads ever to play the game. But in every single postseason, something tripped them up a litany of busted body parts, and weird buzzer beaters of every variety. Phoenix almost always contended, but never overcame all the necessary obstacles. When Nash became a free agent in 2012, he made a winning-oriented move. The Knicks and Raptors seemed likeliest to hand the 38-year-old his final big contract, but Nash's people instead arranged a sign-and-trade to the Lakers, a very good team that hoped to win Kobe one more ring. They magnified that hope into hype after acquiring Dwight Howard. We don't even need to get into that era. This exclamatory preseason SI cover declaring this was going to be fun might have been the high point of the whole ordeal because it was not even a little fun. The Lakers were a disaster. They fired coach Mike Brown after just a few games and replaced him with D'Antoni. Nash broke his leg in his second game, and his body only disintegrated further over his final two years. Those Lakers never even sniffed the finals, and Nash retired ringless as a player, though he'd earned himself some hardware as a consultant for the Warriors dynasty. It's astounding and a little heartbreaking that an elite player who joined elite teammates on elite teams didn't even reach the NBA Finals. Especially given how many of those teammates went on to win without him, even at his expense. They only give out one trophy a year, and you need luck and fortitude to win it. Nash and company often lacked one or the other, falling victim to meddlesome flukes or just buckling in critical moments. But even coming that close that often requires greatness. And that's what Steve Nash was. Great. One of the greatest to ever do it. Cruel twists of fate can never, ever take that away. Thanks for watching Untitled. You can check out episode one about Charles Barkley here, or check this out.